But uh, I think all of the people around who are experts, or were experts on the North are pretty well deceased or in nursing homes or something like that. Uh, there are probably some guys in the audience here that know a lot about the North Mayor, but are afraid to say anything because they potentially end up in jail someplace. Uh, so, uh, to start out, just this picture belonged to the library here and was used on the little poster they did. Uh, that photo was taken by John Heinick. How many of you knew John Heinick? John was a biology professor out at the college. And he had a little cabin freezer and obviously was out. Uh, I would guess that this was probably maybe early in 1967 uh, from the condition of the boat. Uh, it was quite an attractive boat. It was only 12 years old when it ran aground. Is pretty pretty new for the boat. And uh, on here you can see she's stuffed up some uh, uh, in this area here. I think that's ice damage from having spent the winter uh, out on Thunder Bay Shoal. We'll talk a little bit about the, the boat and some of the things that happened. This is a, an early photo of it before it uh, ended up on Thunder Bay Shoal. It's a typical saltwater vessel of the 1950s and 60s. And it's what they call a three island ship. So you have uh, one island is the, is the raised forecastle or forecastle, uh, uh, extra deck up forward. You also had an a extra deck back aft that was called the poop deck. And that goes back to sailing ships. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how the name came about, but you can figure it out pretty easily. So this is what the Nordmere looked like. Uh, the name Nordmere means North Sea in German. Uh, not too surprising there. She came out of Hamburg, Germany. Uh, built in 1954. She was 471 feet long. And she's 60 foot wide. So boats her size couldn't come into the Great Lakes until 1958 when they finished the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and the locks in the Welland Canal were expanded. Prior to that, the, the longest ship that could come into the Great Lakes was 156 feet long. So little puddle jumpers. Uh, not a lot to say. The uh, all excuse me, all of the uh, all of the crew on the on the boat lived in the one superstructure. Great Lake ships on the lakes, you know, a lot of them had the pilot house forward and engine room aft. So the engine room and galley crew worked back aft and lived back aft and the the deck crew all lived up forward. But on, on the saltwater ships, the, uh, uh, generally at this point in time, everybody lived in this center cabin area. Later on, they would move that all the way aft of the ship. Uh, and that then carried over on the Great Lakes, and now all the, all the ships built since the, since the 1970s have had everything back aft. Uh, the, re the reason that everything is that far back from the bow is because this is built and run on the oceans, and have potentially 50, 60 foot waves. So if, if on, the, on the Great Lakes we didn't have waves like that, you could put the pilot house up forward. Those boats uh, on the lakes, they're making a dock every day or two days. The, the critical thing there is for the captain to be able to look out the window and see where the dock is. And uh, if you're back in the middle of the ship, you can't do that very well. But on the ocean, uh, you, you might, might be 30 days before you made a dock. Anyway, these boats, when they came into the lakes, they were involved in an awful lot of accidents. Uh, they're, they're great saltwater sailors. They would have a tug that would take them out of the, the river at Hamburg. They'd get out in the ocean, and then they ran for two weeks to go across to New York or Baltimore or someplace like that with their cargo. When they got there, another tug came out and helped them into, into the dock. They didn't do much in the way of maneuvering. And all of a sudden, they get into the narrow confines of the Detroit River, the St. Clair River, the St. Mary's River, and they were bumping into all kinds of stuff. And uh, that was sort of ended up being her fate also. The story of the Nordmere is actually about six stories in one. You could take any one of these and talk for 45 minutes. Uh, so you have the, the grounding, the rescue of the crew, removal of her cargo, the attempted salvage of the boat, they actually tried to raise the boat, uh, the stripping of the boat by souvenir hunters or pirates, or and, and these were our friends and neighbors here in Alpena for the most part. Uh, there were a few outsiders. And then the removal of oil off the ship, which is a story that actually continues.
continues yet today. There's still some oil out there. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, they had to go out and plug a pipe that was leaking oil. <coughs> the, uh, our story of the Nordmere began November 19, 1966. The boat was on its way to Chicago with a load of steel wire. Comes in great big coils that weigh from 8 to 12 tons per coil. And it was going there to a stamping plant of some kind that would be made into some sort of a product. So it was upbound on the lake. As you come up the lake, a lot of you probably don't know, but there are set courses on the lake. The set courses in the river. They're court, you, you just don't go where you want to go most of the time. You're expected to stay within the confines of the upbound or downbound course. And so she was in the upbound course uh, coming up around Thunder Bay here. And then she was going around to Lake Michigan. So she needs to make a turn here. And the turn probably should have been up in this area right here where the, where the pointer is showing. And what happened is the, the pilot that was aboard the boat programmed the course change into the autopilot. And then he went down to get a little bit of sleep before they get up to the Straits Mackinac where he, it's going to be congested waters and he's going to have to be on duty. Well, the mate on watch, the first mate of the ship, didn't realize that the pilot had programmed in the course change. And he went ahead and programmed in the course change. So instead of making a 22 degree turn, they made a 44 degree turn. And again, these saltwater guys, they're not used to having stuff around them, okay? They're in the middle of the ocean, except for an occasional iceberg. They don't have much to worry about out there. But here you got a lot to worry about because you have shallow water. So off, uh, off Thunder Bay Island here, right, right in this spot here, you see a little difference in the color. Here's deep water, here's shallow water. And right there where the marker is, is Thunder Bay Shoal. In looking at it, I'm pretty sure that it was an ancient shoreline of the lakes. It's all rubble rock this big that's been washed by the waves for years and years and years, so it's nice and smooth on the outside. And that whole shoal is made up of rock like that. And so, you know, if, if there, and there was a bell buoy actually on the, on the end of that shoal. So you got a buoy out there with a bell on it. And if the pilot was looking out the window, he probably would have realized that he was getting kind of close to shore and, and he might want to pay attention. Obviously, that didn't happen. And they ran, they were traveling about 16 miles an hour. And this is a ship of probably 50,000 tons burden. So you don't stop them very fast. Even when you hit something that's pretty much immovable, like Thunder Bay Shoal. And he drove that thing onto Thunder Bay Shoal uh, all the way until it got just after the engine room. So the engine room on the boat is right under that superstructure. And uh, so it tore five, five cargo holes of the ship, tore the, the bottom out of it, and tore the bottom out of the engine room. If it had just been the, the cargo holes, the ship probably would eventually have been refloated and rebuilt and gone on with its life, but uh, it tore a whole lot of steel out underneath the engine room, which is virtually impossible to get to. Uh, so there's the picture, and again, it's the picture we started with of how she looked pretty early on when sit she's sitting on the shoal. The first time I saw it, uh, we came around Thunder Bay Island, and I looked with a pair of binoculars, and I saw this boat out there. And man, it looked for all the world like a boat that was at anchor. And it didn't look like there was anything wrong with it at all. Uh, <clears throat> the bottom is an aerial view taken a few years later. We know it's later because the, uh, the hatch covers are all gone. She's been broken in half. And uh, uh, she settled considerably in the water from what it was here. If you look here, she's got uh, probably a good eight feet from the water line up to the, the, uh, the, the deck rail. And if you look here, the deck rail is at the water level. So she sunk that much in the water. The, <clears throat> there were 43 crew members aboard the ship, quite a large contingent of people uh, on those saltwater ships. 
Uh, right after she won, uh, Wendy Brown, 35 of the crew members were taken off by a passing steamer, the Samuel Mather from Interlake Steamship Company. So basically the crew got off in lifeboats, rode over to the, to the Mather. Eight guys stayed aboard, the captain, the first mate, the ship's carpenter, and an assortment of other crewmen. Their, their first thought was they didn't know how bad, badly the ship was damaged. Uh, they were going to survey to see if, if she could be re refloated. They were also there, obviously, to protect the boat from, from uh, pirates. Uh, <clears throat> two days after she went on, uh, her owning company contracted with a company out of uh, Amherstburg, Ontario, down in the lower Detroit River to uh, come up and take the cargo off. They knew no matter what was going to happen, they needed to get the cargo off. You couldn't raise the ship with, with 990 coils of, uh, of steel on it. So one of the boats that they sent up was this uh, tug Atomic out of Amherstburg. And, and uh, she went up there with a barge that had a big crane on it. And they started taking the, uh, uh, the steel off, and the weather started to deteriorate. And after just a couple of days of really not accomplishing very much, uh, she turned around and went back to Amherstburg. This. Uh, the weather continued to worsen through November 28th when this picture was taken. <clears throat> this was taken sometime during the day on the 28th. We're not sure what time it was. Uh, the guy on the uh, left is the first mate, George Fisher. Uh, the guy on the right with the fancy hat is the, uh, the wireless operator. <clears throat> They're starting to get a little bit concerned at that time. And you see they both have life jackets on. Uh, you look in the background, the, 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 the sea is worsening considerably. This, this picture was taken probably right after that other picture was taken. This picture was taken. And you can see the waves rolling over the, the side of the ship. Uh, they had 50 mile an hour winds, and that night they had seas 22 feet high. With her seven feet of freeboard, she'd have had uh, uh, 15 foot waves rolling across her deck. And they were concerned that the boat was, every time one of these waves would hit that boat, it would just shudder. And they were afraid that the boat was going to roll over during the night. And uh, uh, at 3.30 in the morning, they actually issued an SOS, uh, Save Our Souls. And uh, the, uh, the, the deck had cracked in se several places, and uh, even the, the lowest deck of the main cabin was flooded. So the guys that lived on that main deck, their rooms were, had water, standing water. So they uh, called for help. The closest help, uh, uh, given the size of the waves and the weather conditions, they needed a pretty good size uh, uh, vessel. And so the Mackinac was sent from its home berth in, in uh, Sheboygan, and she got down there at 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, uh, she could not get close to the boat. Obviously, you don't want to get close to a boat that's sitting on a shoal. You can end up sitting next to it. So what they tried to do is they anchored up above her and they lowered one of their big lifeboats on a line, on a heavy mooring line, and, and let it drift down to the, to the Nordmere, thinking that the guys could get off, they would, they would bring that back to the, to the Mackinac, and, and uh, uh, that was unsuccessful. They just, uh, the weather conditions were too bad, they couldn't control that lifeboat. If they had gotten it down there and gotten it alongside the Nordmere, there's probably no way the crew could have gotten off the Nordmere and into the light. So at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the same time that they sent for the Mackinac, uh, the Coast Guard dispatched a helicopter out of Selfridge Air Force Base in Detroit. And that arrived on the scene about 4.30 in the morning. And they, they took the crew off in two batches. Uh, they took the crew from, from the Nordmere to the Mackinac. And then the Mackinac went around into Thunder Bay where it was uh, protected. And uh, uh, one of the fish tubs from Alpena came out and took the crew into Alpena. And uh, 
So that that, uh, that 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 night was the night that the Daniel Morrell sank down in the lower part of Lake Huron uh, with only one survivor. Of the world. So that's how bad the weather. Malcolm Marine of Port Huron, now an American co company, the Canadians couldn't, couldn't do anything. So the, uh, uh, by, the, by this time, the, the ownership of the ship has transferred from the shipping company to their insurance underwriter. And the insurance underwriter contracts with Malcolm Marine of, of Port Huron. You go to Port Huron and get down to where that uh, uh, old light ship is along the shore there. Just, just north of there is Malcolm Marine's uh, tug base. They're still in operation today. A guy named Keith Malcolm owned the company back at this time. Uh, he was contracted to take the steel off. They started diving operations on the, on the boat with bad hangovers on ja January 1st, 1966. <laughs> And this is this is uh, this is what the boat looked like. It was it was uh, had a pretty good coating of ice on it. Uh, before they could start taking steel out of the cargo hold, they had to blast through the ice. There was ice six eight eight feet thick in the cargo hold. And then on top of that, once they got the ice out of the way, when that boat came to this screeching halt, on the, uh, everything jammed forward. So these big 8 to 12 ton rolls of steel are all slammed together in there. You just can't pick one of those out real easily. So what they had to do is they had to, the first few coils of steel, they kind of look at them and figure out, now which ones do we have a chance of getting out of here? And they'd set a charge of dynamite underneath them and blow the thing out. Well, the guy that was handling the... Uh, uh, the dynamite operation always used a little more than was necessary, and I guess some of these coils of steel went 100 feet up in the air. Another view of it here, you can see here the nose of, of, of Malcolm's barge. Again, they had a big, a big crane on the barge that they were using to lift the uh, coils of steel up. There's the aft end of the barge on the left-hand side with the crane. This is in May of 67. You still got all this ice on the boat. Stuff, I've, I've been out there in March, April, May and, and seen ice this, this thick, crystal clear ice you can just about see through the stuff. It's really, really strange. So in those days, all the diving was done with scuba gear and wetsuits. So from January on, these guys were working in the water in the cargo hold of that ship in wetsuits. And uh, uh, your, your body, in a wetsuit, it's like, it's like foam rubber, different thicknesses. And so the idea, and it fits real snug, uh, like spandex, okay? And so the idea is that a layer of water will get through that up against your body, and your body can warm that thin layer of water, and then you don't get much colder. Uh, except as you're moving around and through time, the water starts to move around in your suit, it does, it does get cold. So here's a diver uh, uh, who I think has just come out of the water. This here is uh, Captain Bob Massey. How many of you here remember Bob Massey? Good, good to see a few. Uh, Bob was a good friend of mine. Bob was a retired chief master diver from the Navy. He, he was in, I think his UDT team was team number 112. So the 112th UDT team in the United States Navy. That's pretty early on. And uh, he served with the Navy for 20 years uh, as, a, as a master chief, was all over the world, mostly on big construction projects. Uh, he was involved with the Navy in Korea got run over by a landing craft, he got his legs all busted up. If you, if you remember Bob, he walked around like this a lot, and he had real bow legs because they were broken. I think he had like 80 broken bones or something in the lower half of his body. Uh, one of the toughest guys I ever known. He was very smart. I had college education, but he, he was really tough, and he was really a good seaman. He, he really was a good 
good boat handler. He, uh, you know, he, he really knew boats, loved boats. So uh, he was retired up here, and Keith Malcolm hired him to run the, the removal operation. This piece of equipment right here is what they used to lift the coils. So that wire there is attached to the crane that's on the, on the barge, and we'll see here in a minute how they, uh, how they lifted them up. So this is the cargo hold of just aft of the, uh, let me think, just forward of the, of the stern of the ship. And so here's that hook that you saw, and the one leg of it is stuck through the hole in the center of that coil of steel. And that's how they lift it. There it is up in the air. Rusted, rusted almost immediately. If you look here, it's kind of rusted. <coughs> uh, it's a real thin coat of rust. We brought uh, we brought steel up off the Monrovia, which had sunk in the late fifties, and uh, so fifty, say fifty-eight, sixty-eight. It had been down maybe fifteen years, and it was really kind of fun to watch when the the steel on the Monrovia was angle iron bar stock and uh, reinforcing rod. And it was all in one ton bundles. And when, uh, when the crane would lift one of these bundles up out of the water, the instant it hit the air, you saw this big puff and it, it rusted that fast. Yeah, it was almost instant it rusted that fast. So here is a uh, uh, Malcolm's tug, the Malcolm, and their barge. So here's the barge here, tugs over here. And here are the coils of steel on the, uh, on the deck of the barge. So they put them on the barge, and then they took them to Rockport, which is really the closest port to the location out there. And they would take them into Rockport, and then they, they would have a, a fleet of semis, flatbed semis would come in, and uh, most semis would take maybe two or three coils of, of steel. So when you have 990 coils to move, this was a big operation. And it ran 24 hours a day for a very long period of time. So this is a 1967 photo. It was taken by one of the uh, uh, Air Force units that was out at Phelps Collins Field, aerial view. That's after she's been, the cargo's all been removed from her. And at that point in time, every person in Northeast Michigan who had a 10-foot boat with a pair of oars on it <laughs> had to go out to the Nordmere. And they stripped the boat from stem to stern and top to bottom. Uh, they took everything and things they couldn't take, they broke. Uh, they were, they were, for the most part, souvenir hunters, but there were some people that were semi-professional thieves that went into it. One was a guy named Dick Race from Chicago. Anybody here know Dick Race? He was around here quite a bit. He had a beautiful, beautiful boat called the Neptune, and it was a uh, all-aluminum hull boat, kind of boat they built for the offshore oil industry, and it was built down in the bayous of Louisiana someplace. And that thing was rigged for underwater salvage. And Race worked for Raytheon or one of the big uh, uh, electronic companies. Had all kinds of fancy electronic equipment, and they they found a lot of shipwrecks around the Northern Lakes, and they uh, scrounged stuff off those wrecks and off a lot of stuff. Uh, how many of you know Jack Thompson from Alpena? Jack Jack and Dick Race were like losing buddies. And Jack spent a lot of time diving with Dick. So they went on here while everybody else is taking the cases of German beer out of the, the cooler. Race and his buddies went up and they stripped the navigational equipment from the pilot house all the way down to the engine room. They walked off with all the radars, the radios, uh, the uh, uh, autopilot, everything that, all, all of which had value. And, uh, so when I, when I went out there, which was considered
considerably later, June 67, I went out there in 68, yeah, late 68, uh, there wasn't a whole lot left. When you got underwater, like down in the engine room, there were still a lot of tools around, like in all, all these different workrooms and stuff, you would find tools, many of which were, you know, completely usable. We also took off uh, uh, pumps, big pumps that they would have used for ballasting the ship or pumping the bilges or whatever. We took a couple diesels out that were probably generators aboard that. Uh, you, some of you might remember that uh, Massey bought the old John Kendall, a steam powered fish tug, from, not fish tug, steam powered fireboat from Detroit and uh, brought it up here and was at the west dock at the cement plant. And he took that steam engine out of it and one of these diesels went into the, the, uh, uh, the Kendall. So uh, we, we took our share of stuff off also. So there was a salvage effort made at this time, an outfit of all the, the this, the first time I went out to the, to the Nordmere, on the forward side of the cabin, there's a big sign on there, stay off property of U.S. Automobile Club of Detroit. <laughs> what the heck? And it took a long time before I heard the story. Uh, it was a bunch of guys that wanted to build an auto racing track in the Detroit area. And they had done a lot of design work and, and costed things up. It was going to cost about $4 million to, de to build this racetrack. And they didn't have that kind of money. And one of them said, hey, there's this 12-year-old German ship sitting on a shoal up off Thunder Bay. We could raise that thing and sell it. And it's got to be worth more than $4 million. And we go build our racetrack. They figured that it was going to cost them half a million dollars to raise it. Now, these guys know a whole lot about building racetracks, apparently. They didn't know squat about <laughs> raising <the> ships. <laughs> they estimated it could have been completed in eight weeks. Okay? Now remember, we got five cargo holds with the bottom ripped out and the bottom of the engine room is gone. Uh, and then their idea was that they would, they would take the the two stories. The one I read in the Alpena News said it was going to it was going to be taken to Rockford by the Massey D, which was Bob Massey's boat. Uh, Bob Massey always told me that that he was supposed to take the boat to Alpena, and it, and that sounds more logical to me. You take it to Alpena, park at the river someplace. You got all kinds of services of different types available. Rockford, you got nothing. You know? uh, but anyway, that was their idea. So Massey would have towed it with the Massey D. I don't know some of you may remember this boat. It used to tie up in the river over here for years. Uh, it was built in 1905. So she was an old timer. I, I went on her in 68 and uh, uh, was on, it, on and off for several years. It was built as a sand sucker. And there were quite a few. This one operated out of Detroit. But you saw a lot of them down at Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And they would get into sandy areas and they would either dredge with a, with a crane and bucket like they're doing right here, or they would, if they were, the water was shallow enough, they would, this right here is a, is a suction rig. This is the end and the cutter end would be dropped over the side. And the boat would move along very, very slowly. And there's a big, you know, thousand horsepower pump in the forward end of the boat. And it would suck sand up off the bottom and then it's dumped uh, in, the, in the cargo hold here, which is open. It's like a big, big hopper. And, and, and it was designed so that they would pump this sandy water in there. And then the, there were scuppers along the side. The water drains out, the sand stays there. Then they go in and unload it with their crane. And it's a very fine sand. It's used in the cast, to make steel castings or iron castings. So the value of it's pretty high. And this boat had operated out of Detroit. The old timer that owned it had a, a propane stove in his kitchen, his galley, back in the 
in the stern of the boat back here. This was bedrooms and kind of a lounge area and a small kitchen. And he came back to the boat drunk one night. He apparently left the stove on and the burner was out. And he lit a match to see where he was going and blew, blew himself up and blew the whole stern off the boat. So Massey and his partner, Dave Funk, anybody here know Dave Funk? Good. Dave was at Besser Corporation. He and Massey were buddies. I don't remember how they managed to hook up. But they went down and they rebuilt the whole stern of the boat around Detroit. They bought the, brought the boat up here. Their plan was to do uh, salvage and construction work. They knew that Huron Cement had an ongoing need for uh, dredging in their harbor or uh, breaking ice for their boats to get in and out of harbor at the start or the end of the shipping season, that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, that's what the, the D stands for Dave. So Massey and Dave Funk were the partners in it. And Dave was kind of the, 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 the uh, silent partner because of his position out at, out at Besson. So they began thus trying to raise the boat in June of 67. Their eight week project kind of went. Yeah, that's, that's how you say it. Uh, they abandoned the project in December of 68. Uh, just before they abandoned it, they actually made their attempt to raise it. And so Massey was hired. He was standing by with the Massey D to take the thing in tow. He watched it. He swears that they intentionally snapped it in half. And his explanation was that these guys had raised way more money than the hull of that boat was going to be worth. And that if they had gotten it up and got it to a dock someplace, they'd have had a whole bunch of big lawsuits from irate investors who had gotten taken in the deal. So what, what basically they apparently did not patch the holes under the engine room. They patched the holes for and after that. And, and that last day they pumped, they started like at midnight pumping water out of the cargo hold for and aft. And you could, you could see the bow of the boat coming up and you could see the stern of the boat coming up and you don't see the, the middle of the boat moving at all. And uh, Bob says that, that uh, uh, when she finally cracked, that the, the point of the bow was almost completely out of line. So the ends were way up like this, and finally the hull gave in. And, uh, and she broke right here completely through. This had been damaged here on top side, but the bottom wasn't damaged. The bottom was in a continuous line, uh, but that snapped it in half. So that ended the, the, uh, the salvage effort. I don't know a lot about salvage, but I've read a lot of articles about how different ships on the lakes were salvaged. I do not think that this ship was ev ever salvaged. I mean, I think the damage was terminal to it. In 1969, uh, Bob Massey called me up. I was working, I was a news guy at uh, WHSB uh, radio station. And we had something on about water pollution or something. And when I got done with the news, Bob Massey's on the phone, wants to talk to me. And he tells me about how there's this boat parked on the, the uh, Thunder Bay Shoal over here and it's leaking oil and it's, it's got a lot of oil on it. And if it breaks up, that stuff is going to come into Thunder Bay and it's going to kill the wildfowl and kill the fish and this and that and the other thing. And this picture, actually, this is the slip. That's the oil slip off the stern of the Nordmere. This was taken by a uh, pilot for the Department of Natural Resources. They do the, the fire spotting flights and they noticed it. Well, then they started flying over it every day or two. And they were recording oil slips that were 7 to 10 miles long and 1 to 2 miles wide. That's a pretty good size slip. So at the radio station, this is, I mean, this is a big news story that nobody else obviously knows about. So we did a half hour special on the thing that had a lot of listeners around. 
got Joe Swallow, was the state rep at that time, he got involved, you know, demanding that the Department of Natural Resources do something. Our Department of Natural Resources start, starts demanding that the Fed water quality people do something. Uh, made uh, all the Detroit newspapers, Detroit TV stations. Uh, uh, Phil Richards from the Alpena News, the publisher of the Alpena News, called me at the radio station and said, hey, uh, any chance we could run your story in our paper? And uh, so we worked out a deal that we were going to rerun our special program. And so we said, OK, you can run the story, but you have to have something in there about the fact we're going to be broadcasting this special. We did that, and I think a month later, Phil offered me a job, and I went to work at the Alpena News. So anyway, uh, after this ruckus, uh, the Federal Water Quality Administration uh, contracted with Massey to remove 21,000 gallons of oil. Where they came up with that figure, I, I have no idea. We, we estimated there were 70 to 80,000 gallons of, of heavy oil aboard the ship when she went on there. 70 to 80,000 gallons. When you're coming across the ocean, you have, you have a fuel tanks that probably carry a quarter of a million gallons of fuel. So it sounds like a lot. On the Great Lakes, most of our ships would, have, would use 100,000 gallon tanks just running up and down the lakes. There's uh, me on my first trip to the Northward in March of 1970. Uh, it was kind of a breezy day. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the Massey D tied up alongside the, the Northward. To give you some idea, there's a little pilot house. The crane of the Massey D is back there. Here's the stern of the Northward. You could stand on this stern deck and not get your feet wet. And from right here, from this line right here forward, again, you could walk the deck, there was, it was out of water. So both ends of the ship were kind of up in the center of water. This is for, taken from on the Nordmere, looking down on the deck of the Massey D. Uh, whoops. The, uh, the Massey D has a crane on the stern. This is that suction pipe that I showed you in the other, uh, in the other photo. And this big, big, big open deck area. This is a generator here. I'm not exactly, I guess, I'm not exactly sure why we have that. So then Massey took 21,000 gallons off. And in the summer of 1970, the thing starts leaking again. Yeah, you know, it, it had more than 21,000 gallons of fuel. So this is, these, were, these pictures were taken. There was a commercial photographer in town for a couple of years at a place over on Chisholm over here by the Owl someplace. And he came out with us one weekend, and uh, this was one of his pictures. We, uh, we spent a lot of time on there. You know, we'd go out. What, what, what I, I was working at the radio station in the newspaper. The, the crew that was out there working on the job would always come into town Friday afternoon uh, and get replenished with uh, food and fill all their, their scuba tanks and stuff like that. The reason they did that was Dave Funk had to work Monday to Friday at, at Messer. So Saturday morning at 6 o'clock, the Massey D left the dock, and Funk would be along, and I would be along. And we would go out Saturday and Sunday. Sunday night, they would bring us back into town. So we were out there, uh, knew every inch of the boat, always looking for some treasure that people had passed over. Actually, oil is uh, uh, lighter than water, so it actually gives you some buoyancy. Uh, we used to, it's inside this, uh, inside this cabin here, on the main deck when you went in, there was a big double stairway went up to the next deck. Anybody that was out there, uh, it got torn down. And I think, actually, I think our guys tore it down trying to keep people out of the upper cabins. Uh, uh, but it was a big, beautiful double stairway that went up. It was quite a, quite a nice ship. 
And on the top deck, way up on top up here, uh, the deck up there was all teak. Big, thick teak planking. So we had a charcoal grill up there and some deck chairs and, uh, you know, we work hard all day and then we go up there and drink German beer and cook steaks and whatever, whatever. Uh, it was really, it was, uh, it was a real pleasant experience. Uh, so anyway, when it started leaking in in, in uh, 1970, uh, I was still at the newspaper, wrote a lot of articles, got a lot of press. Uh, so uh, some big shots decided they would make an inspection tour. I don't know that they believed what they were hearing from us. Uh, but they were brought out by a Coast Guard helicopter and uh, dropped onto the foredeck of, uh, of the Nordic. That's Joe Swallow being lowered down in a basket. Bob Massey standing there holding on to the basket. Uh, let's see if I can remember these guys here. This is Massey here with shirtless. Uh, Bill Richardson from the Federal Water, Water Quality Administration. He was like the Great Lakes supervisor for the federal agency. This is Commander Sperry from the Coast Guard from Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, he did the last inspection on the uh, Fitzgerald before it sank. And all of us who got to know Sperry over a period of a year or so, we figured he probably was somehow responsible for it because the man was just completely incompetent. The only thing he could do, the only saving grace he had is I've never seen anyone tie a bowline as fast as that guy could tie a bowline. 